And now, if a regular lawyer were nominated for the Supreme Court by lawyer and comedian J.L. Covan. Yeah, I basically did a lot of document review, which was just staring at emails and doing 12 hours of clicking every day for large corporations. Do I condone what some of these corporations are doing? No. No, in fact, I hate most of them. But I needed a job, and this was the best one I could get. Did I study critical race theory in law school? No. No, I barely studied in law school. I just basically passed because they hate to fail you in law school. And then I just took the bar and luckily passed that. And here we are. My judicial philosophy, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, for the first like five years of my legal career, I was just basically an extremely well-paid mouse-clicking robot with a lot of people yelling at me and just a lot of stress. I don't really remember a lot of law school. I did okay, but mostly once I got to my day job, I just focused on like two different things and never really kept up on law journals or scholarship or anything. I just billed my 10 hours a day and then went home and watched some streaming services and then just prayed that it was a weekend because I'd lost track of uh, the days of the week because they had us working a lot more than I wanted to. Stand up. And now, Stand Up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, if I'm not invited to my aunt's birthday party, could I invite myself over for a pajama party instead? Hmm. And what's the point of seeing the new movie Where the Crawdads Sing if actress Daisy Edgar Jones is at fighting off a violent crustacean mob? And now, the podcast host who steers clear of crawdads unless they're steamed, buttered, and delicious, Pete! Dominic! Thank you very much, Pete Co. You know, we used to catch the uh, the crayfish, as we called them, growing up. It was a great hobby of ours, a great interest of ours. When we were little, we'd go down to the creek, we'd turn over a rock, and there they would be, and we would snatch them, and we would take them out of their natural habitat, and, and sometimes launch them in SD's rockets. But who didn't torture pond wildlife in the 80s? Come on, it was the 80s. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for tuning in to today's episode of Stand Up. I'm here every day, a Monday through Friday. I post the show usually by 2 a.m. at the latest or earliest. Depends on how you live your life, and I'm not judging, folks. Anytime you listen to the show, tell your friends about it. I appreciate it. Got an awesome episode for you today. Both Anya Kamenetz, the NPR education correspondent, author, and journalist, joins me to talk about her new book about what we lost, what children especially lost during the pandemic, and the most respected journalist, according to me, but certainly one of the most respected journalists when it comes to redistricting and gerrymandering, the former editor-in-chief of Salon.com, author most recently of Rat Fuck, the story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy, senior fellow at Fair Vote, David Daly joins me again for two great conversations. I think you're going to love both my guests. But before I get to that, I've got to get to the news. Ava's back for good news. And I've got a whole bunch of stories that I want to play audio from and so much more. So it's time to get to the last 24. Putin's invasion of Ukraine continues. President Biden is headed to Europe in an effort to bolster the Western alliance. A Kiev suburb was retaken. When Ukrainian fighters thwarted Russian advances, the fight continues to rage for Maripol. Gas now averaging $6 a gallon in L.A. Spring break state of emergency in Miami Beach, where massive shootings have continued. The Miami airport uh, apparently had their busiest day in history. Terrible storms and tornadoes down south doing tremendous damage in cities like New Orleans. And apparently a heat wave is about to strike the California, the, the West Coast. So look out for that, friends. But the top story that drove the day was day one, really day two of Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. 
where she and Democratic senators had a forceful pushback and debunked all this horrifically stupid and terribly dangerous child sex sentencing claims. Judge Jackson defended her role as a as a defender. She'd be the first justice in decades to have experience defending people accused of crimes as opposed to the normal prosecutors. Republican senators tried to pin down her judicial philosophy so that she would somehow have to identify as a liberal. She voiced her support for keeping standing by precedent that Roe v. Wade provides a woman's choice for an abortion. And Republicans, of course, tried to draw the first black woman ever to be nominated into a debate on race. A whole bunch of white men and Marsha Blackburn, a white woman, She, of course, emphasized she's never used critical race theory to determine a case, and she used direct language to distance herself from it all day. So let's listen to some of the highlights. Here is a mashup. This is a terrible mashup of Ted Cruz because he was the one who focused. Each senator got about 30 minutes to question her, and they went from like 9 in the morning, I think, to almost 7 p.m. I think that's going to be the same case for today's hearings, but... Shout out to the editor at The Recount, I think, who made this mashup. This is just Ted Cruz talking about race and critical race theory. It's about 53 seconds, if you can tolerate it. I think it illustrates perfectly exactly what his strategy was, was to just keep saying words. This is exactly what they do at the Board of Education meetings across the country. Just keep saying the words. Judge Jackson, welcome. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. Critical, critical race, race theory. theory. Marxists. Marxism. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. Filled and overflowing with critical race theory. Critical race theory, an introduction. But how to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. The babies confess when being racist. Babies are racist. Can we send white people back to Europe? Critical race theory. It's child pornography. Sexual predators. Sex crimes. It release sex offenders. Give sex offenders statutes. So sex, sex offenders. Sex of, in which sex offenders for sexual predators. 6,300 sex offenders would be released to the public. And we're talking about child pornography offenders who may not be pedophiles. Child pornography. The child porn. Child pornography. Pedophiles. Child pornography. Child pornography. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. There you go. Ted Cruz. Saying a whole bunch of words. Now, here is a back and forth with them in context, and then we'll be done with him. Critical race theory, as you know, originated at your and my alma mater at the, at the Harvard Law School. Uh, in your understanding, what, what does critical race theory mean? What is it? Senator, my understanding is that critical race theory is, um, it is an academic theory that is about the ways in which Uh, race interacts with um, various institutions. It doesn't come up in my work as a judge. It's never something that I've uh, studied or relied on, and it wouldn't be something that I would rely on if I was on the Supreme Court. So critical race theory, as you know, has its origins in the critical legal studies movement, which also came from Harvard Law School, from a number of critical legal studies professors, crits as they were known when we were in law school, Uh, who are explicitly Marxist, and they find their origins in Marxism, although critical legal studies frames society as a fundamental battle between socioeconomic classes, critical race theory frames all of society as a fundamental and intractable battle uh, between, between the races. It views every conflict as, as a racial conflict. Um, Do you think that's an accurate way of viewing society in the world we live in? Senator, I don't think so, Um, but I've never studied critical race theory and I've never used it. It doesn't come up in the work that I do as a judge. All right, now I'm going to torture you a little more with something from Lindsey Graham. I know you probably saw some of this or all of this, but... I wanted to try to try to provide context. I mean, what were you expecting on today's episode of Stand Up? I paid attention to most of the hearings or a lot of the hearings in and out all day. But I did see Lindsey Graham get up and storm off. But here's another mashup, an edited mashup from the recount again of Lindsey Graham talking about everybody but Ketanji Brown Jackson sitting in front of him. I found it offensive when they said it about Judge Barrett and that uh, Judge Barrett, I thought, was treated very, very poorly. Do you know Janice Rogers Brown? 
Did you know that Joe Biden actively filibustered Janice Rogers Brown? The Mr. Jeffries thing. Senator Kennedy, God rest his soul, who beat the crap out of the guy. And that was my job in the Air Force. I was a Air Defense Counsel. Former Gitmo detainee Zakir Mohammed Fazal. Waziki was appointed as acting intelligence director. Omar was appointed as the new governor of the southeastern province of Coast. I thought that was the right answer for Judge Alito. Did you know that a lot of people from the left were trying to destroy Michelle Childs? This whole thing by the left about this war ain't working. Then he gets up and walks out. <laughs> See you later, Linz. But this was one of the most talked about moments in the hearing yesterday when Senator Lindsey Graham asked what, fa- what, what your religion is. What faith are you, by the way? Senator, I am um, Protestant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Non-denominational. Okay. Could you fairly judge a Catholic? What the fuck? Senator, I have a record of I think the answer would be yes. judging I mean, everyone. I believe you can. I'm just <laughs> yeah. asking this question because how important is your faith to you? Senator, personally, um, my faith is very important. Um, but as you know, there's no religious test in the Constitution under under Article 6. and There will be none with me. And... <laughs> Um, it, it's very important to set aside one's personal views yeah, about I, things I, I, in, I, in the role of a judge. I couldn't agree with you more, and I believe you can. So uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how faithful would you say you are? What the? F- in terms of religion. You know, I go to church probably three times a year, so that speaks poorly of me. <laughs> we didn't really think that you cared about anything. Or do you, do you attend church regularly? Well, Senator, I am reluctant to talk about my Good. faith in this way just because I want to be um, mindful of the need for the public to uh, have confidence in my ability to separate out my personal views. Well, how would you feel if a senator up here said your faith, a dogma lives loudly within you and that's of concern? How would you feel if somebody up here on our side said, you know, you attend church too much for me or your faith is a little bit different to me and they would suggest that it would affect your decision? Would you find that offensive? Senator, I'm I'm I would, right, so I now we know what he was getting at. He was talking about how Democratic senators have said that to Republican or conservative nominees. And I'm sure he was talking specifically about this. You may already know who he was talking about. But of course, I mean, gosh, I guess he's right. I guess he's right. But if your religious views inform you somehow to persecute persecute people because of their gender or their their sexual orientation, then, yeah, that is a problem. So I can see it both ways, I guess. But it was a clunky way to get there. And still, I don't think scored any points. And then again, he stormed off later. I think Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson proved on Tuesday that she was smarter than all of the Republican senators, probably all the Democratic senators as well. I saw someone on Twitter saying 100 years from now, Judge Jackson will be remembered as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. No one will remember Senator Hawley or Cruz or Cotton. I hope he's right. And the other weird thing was you can't, I think, sit there and watch that hearing and and wonder why they aren't investigating some of those Republican senators up there as well. Anybody else with me doing that all day? All right. A couple more quick clips for you. Here is uh, John Kennedy from Louisiana saying weird shit that doesn't make any sense. Certainly out of context. I don't know what he was talking about, but I'm only playing it so we can play another Republican senator making fun of him. I'm rather fond of the Bill of Rights, too, and I know you are as well. I've never believed that the Bill of Rights was there for the uh, for the high school quarterback what? or the prom queen. Hmm? They're covered by it. But the Bill of Rights is there to protect the rights who, of people who don't see the world exactly like everybody else or who don't look 
exactly like everybody else. All right, I only play that so I could play Republican Ben Sass from Nebraska making fun of him. So the farming and ranching people where I'm where I come from uh, know that John Kennedy is super smart Rhodes lawyer who kind of pretends to be a you know aw shucks kind of guy as he picks your pocket. Um, Grassley and Do I, I get equal time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> he, al- he always gets unequal time. One of the rare moments of levity that I witnessed, at least during yesterday's hearings. I do think the most compelling moment of yesterday's hearings was when Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson delivered a lengthy and forceful response to Senator Josh Hawley's accusation that her work on child pornography cases, which are all kinds of different things, quote, endanger children. And he wasn't the only one to say that. There is Senator Rick Scott, I saw saying it as well. And Senator Hawley attacked Judge Jackson on TV and on a lengthy Twitter rant last week, the conclusion which asserted that her record on child pornography cases, quote, endangers our children. Well, the attacks have been reviewed and debunked by multiple news outlets. And that was mentioned yesterday, a vociferous uh, defense from Senators Chris Coons and then, of course, the chairman, Senate Judiciary Chairman Dick Durbin, who gave her some time to respond to these characterizations in what I think it's fair to say are pretty emotional, starkly emotional terms. And I'm going to play this whole clip for you. It's six minutes. If you already heard it, then you can fast forward ahead. But I, it's certainly it's worth hearing again, as hard as it is to hear. I think it showcases her in every possible way and also helps understand all these amazing heroes, public defenders and those in law enforcement and mental health that have to deal with these kinds of just nightmarish issues. I want to turn to that issue because it was raised multiple times, primarily by the senator from Missouri. And it was he was questioning your sentencing record in child pornography cases. Uh, that do not involve the production of pornographic material. They're known as non-production cases. I wanted to put some context here. The senator from Missouri has in his tweets said of your position on this issue, Judge Jackson has a pattern of letting child porn offenders off the hook for their appalling crimes, both as a judge and a policymaker. She's been advocating it since law school. This goes beyond soft on crime, the senator said. I'm concerned this is a record that endangers our children. I thought about his charges as I watched you and your family listening carefully yesterday and what impact it might have had on you personally to know that your daughters, husband, parents, family, and friends were hearing the charges that your implementation of this law, sentencing, endangered children. Could you tell us what was going through your mind at that point? Thank you, Senator. Um, As a mother and a judge who has had to deal with these cases, I was thinking that nothing could be further from the truth. These are some of the most difficult cases that a judge has to deal with because we're talking about pictures of sex abuse of children. We're talking about graphic descriptions that judges have to read and consider when they decide how to sentence in these cases. And there's a statute that tells judges what they're supposed to do. Congress has decided what it is that a judge has to do in this and any other case when they sentence. And that statute, that statute doesn't say look only at the guidelines and stop. The statute doesn't say um, impose the the highest possible penalty for this sickening and egregious crime. The the statute says calculate the guidelines, but also look at various aspects of this offense and impose a sentence that is, quote, sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. And in every case, when I am dealing with something like this, it is important to me to make sure that the children's perspective, the children's voices 
are represented in my sentencings. And what that means is that for every defendant who comes before me and who suggests, as they often do, that they're just a looker, that these crimes don't really matter, they've collected these things on the internet and it's fine, I tell them about the victim statements that have come in to me as a judge. I tell them about the adults who are former child sex abuse victims who tell me that they will never have a normal adult relationship because of this abuse. I tell them about the ones who say, I went into prostitution, I uh, fell into drugs because I was trying to suppress the hurt that was done to me as an, as an infant. And the one that was the most um, telling to me that I describe at almost every one of these sentencings when I look in the eyes of a defendant who is weeping because I'm giving him a significant sentence. What I say to him is, do you know that there is someone who has written to me and who has told me that she has developed agoraphobia. She cannot leave her house because she thinks that everyone she meets will have seen her, will have seen her pictures on the internet. They're out there forever. At the most vulnerable time of her life. And so she's paralyzed. I tell that story to every child porn defendant as a part of my sentencings so that they understand what they have done. I say to them that there's only a market for this kind of material because there are lookers, that you are contributing to child sex abuse, and then I impose a significant sentence and all of the additional restraints that are available in the law. These people are looking at 20, 30, 40 years of supervision. They can't use their computers in a normal way for decades. I am imposing all of those constraints because I understand how significant, how damaging, how horrible this crime is. There you go. Watching these hearings made me want to learn more. I'll reach out to some of my public defender friends and try to get them on because I certainly learned a lot in hearing from Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, not from the Republicans asking our questions. I also learned a lot from certain other senators, Democratic senators like uh, Richard Blumenthal and Chris Coons as well. A lot of lawyers up there. But by the way, Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut on Judge Jackson's Supreme Court confirmation hearing said Quote, it was probably the single most skillful, insightful, adroit, but very candid performance in a confirmation hearing that I've seen in my close to 12 years in the Senate. Steve Bannon over at Maddow blog wrote a great blog saying that Josh Hawley meant to make Judge Jackson look awful. He denigrated himself in the prog- in the process, however. The Daily Beast says Republicans didn't even bother dog whistling today. They just went straight to the racist attacks against the first black woman Supreme Court nominee. Well, that's what Wajahad Ali wrote in his Daily Beast latest. Let me know. I can't wait to see or hear your reaction on the confirmation hearings. Let me know. Email me standupwithpete at gmail.com and we'll talk about it at tomorrow night's hangout, I'm sure. Let's get to some of the other news, or at least audio, I have for you from the last 24. It was a disgraceful day for Republican senators, but maybe no one more than Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, who said that uh, yesterday that the United States Supreme Court overstepped when it ruled that states could not ban interracial marriage in its decision in Loving v. Virginia in 1967. The Times of Northwest Indiana reported he was taking calls from an in-state reporter when he was asked a question about mixed-race marriages. Here it is. So you would be okay with the Supreme Court leaving the question of interracial marriage to the states? Yes, I think that that's something that uh, if you're not wanting the Supreme Court to weigh in, on issues like that, 
uh, you're not going to be able to have your cake and eat it, too. I think that's hypocritical. About Griswold versus Connecticut. Do well, you, you can think- list a whole host of issues when it comes down to whatever they are. Uh, I'm going to say that they're not going to all make you happy uh, within a given state, but that we're better off having states manifest their points of view rather than homogenizing it across the country as Roe versus Wade did. Hey, no, no offense there, uh, Mike Brown, uh, but uh, is it Braun or Brown? I, you know, it, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but that hell, it's, I understand what you're saying there, but uh, so I'm a white guy and I want to marry the woman I love who happens to be a, a black woman, or in this case now a black man, I can marry a black man, and, and you're, you're saying that I want to have my cake and eat it too. No, no, I just want to marry, I just want to marry my girlfriend who happens to be darker skin than me. And it's not, I'm not asking for cake or eating anything. Just want to marry the woman I love. So if you could stop being an asshole, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Oh, you can't, oh, you can't stop being an asshole. Okay. Senator Mike Brown later walked that back in a statement where he said earlier during a virtual press conference, I misunderstood a line of questioning that ended up being about interracial marriage. Let me be clear on that issue. There is no question the Constitution prohibits discrimination of any kind based on race. That is not something that is even up for debate. And I condemn racism in any form and at all levels, uh, any states, entities or individuals, (laughs) except for interracial (laughs) marriage. Okay, well, that was a a weird thing to get wrong or misunderstand. But let's, of course, go ahead and give them the benefit of the doubt. Or not. Or maybe we don't need to. All right, well, I mentioned a couple of headlines coming out of Putin's invasion in Ukraine. I, I don't have any audio for you. I was so focused on those confirmation hearings today, and I just had to take a day away from it myself. And we'll be back at it with guests and more about it. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. But that's all the audio I've got for you. I do have a lot more headlines coming your way and what we call affectionately, lovingly, the news dump. Ladies and gentlemen, the great voiceover announcer, actor, musician, it's Pete Coe. Today's jingle is based on a story submitted by John Carroll. Here is the CBS Evening News telling it, and then we'll head over to Pete's jingle. A surveillance camera in Connecticut captured a wild altercation. It happened when this black bear climbed into this pig enclosure and began attacking. But the two pigs, get this, named Hammy and Mary, fought back, turning their home into a boxing ring. Clearly, they won that round. Yeah, because you see in the video, the the bear, like, jumps back out of the pig pen. Well, hit it, Pico! Hammy and Mary, giant hogs, backs are in a hump. The bear didn't stand a chance on today's news dump. (laughs) I love the sound effects. Thank you, Pete. All right, well, let's get to some of those headlines. The Utah governor vetoed a bill banning trans girls in school sports. How about that? The governor's name is Spencer Cox, and on Tuesday, he vetoed a Republican-backed bill that would ban transgender girls from participating in girls' sports in schools, calling it a flawed measure with serious legal And financial risks. The veto came a day after another Republican governor, Eric Holcomb of Indiana, halted a similar bill passed by that state's legislatures. How about that? Governors in states including Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi, and Iowa have signed into law bills that ban trans girls from competing in girls' sports. And wrote the point that I've been making over and over. Rarely has so much fear and anger been directed at so few people. And speaking of hatred, employees of the Walt Disney Company staged walkouts and social media campaigns on Tuesday to protest the company's response to Florida legislation that would limit classroom discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity. According to Reuters and a number of other news outlets, Disney employees staged walkouts to protest the company's response to the Florida bill. Holding signs saying, Disney, stand with us against, quote, don't say gay. The protest culminated a week of abbreviated walkouts during scheduled breaks as part of a campaign dubbed Disney Do Better Walkout. I saw headlines that both Jen Psaki, the president's spokeswoman, and Hillary Clinton have both tested positive for COVID. It made me wonder as attention starts to wane as the 
virus starts to wane, will we stop naming prominent people who test positive for COVID? I wonder. I'm not saying that we should. I'm just wondering if we're going to stop hearing prominent people when, when they get sick. I don't know. Oh, and just as I'm seeing that, I see the German president and his wife have ta- tested positive for COVID. And so has the king of Norway. In the related story, Norway still has a king. Other COVID-related headlines, New Zealand will remove their pandemic mandates. A new study saying COVID increases risk of developing diabetes. The United States has agreed to lift tariffs on British steel and aluminium, or as you say it, aluminum, mending a rift between allies that dates back to the Trump administration. Thought that was an interesting story to mention. Well, Germany might be in a tough situation if they're not able to continue to get Russian natural gas, but hey, at least Tesla opened a new battery factory near Berlin. It's first in Europe, the electric car manufacturer opening its first European factory in factory on the outskirts of Berlin, an effort to challenge German automakers on their home turf. How about that story? Sad news out of China, where no survivors were found in that horrific plane crash. And less than a year after, quote, natural reduction or human body composting was legalized in Colorado, the state has laid to rest its first legally composted human remains. The anonymous person's remains were put into a chamber at the natural funeral, it's called. Six months ago, along with wood chips, alfalfa straw, and microbial beans, the natural digestion and conversion process takes about six months, and about a pickup truck's bed worth of soil is produced. And that is what I want for my remains. I'm putting it here on the record and uh, grow a tree on me. I mentioned tornadoes ripping through North Texas, damaging homes and business, New Orleans as well. And finally, Canadian uh, Canada's Prime Minister, hey Carlo, up in Canada, and so many other Canadians as well. Sandor, who else? Am I, who am I missing? All right, Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, set to stay in power until 2025. How do we feel about that, guys? After cutting an unexpected deal with the opposition New Democratic Party, Trudeau's Liberal Party fell short of a, of a majority in uh, September's election. It, it's been relying on the leftist NDP to help pass legislation. I don't understand how it all works, but Justin Trudeau apparently staying in power for three more years at least. That is an interesting development. All right, that's all the news dump headlines I've got for you. But now let's head over to some happy news. I've got Ava back out in the shed. Hey, Ave, what do you got for us? have a world happiness report oh i love the world happiness report this is where they make up all kinds of criteria to decide who's happy and it's never us i think (laughs) anyway go ahead what do we got the world happiness report a publication of the u.n sustainable development solutions network that draws on global survey data from people in about 150 countries is out and for the fifth year in a row, Finland is the world's happiest country, according to the report's rankings, based largely on life evaluations from the Gallup World Poll. The Nordic country and its neighbors, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland, all score very well on measures the report uses to explain its findings. Healthy life expectancy, GDP per capita, social support in times of cu- trouble, low corruption and high social trust, generosity in a community where people look after each other and freedom to make key life decisions. Oh, that does sound like a lot of happiness. Denmark comes at number two in this year's rankings, followed by Iceland at number three. Sweden and Norway are seventh and eighth, respectively. Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg take places four through six, with Israel coming out at number nine and New Zealand rounding out the top at 10. All right, well, wait, wait a second. Where are we? Canada's 15, the United States is number 16, and the United Kingdom is number 17. Okay, my problem with these reports are all the countries that are the top are like small countries that lack a lot of diversity. It doesn't, it doesn't seem fair. What do you think? I mean... Survey says they have all the data. You're right. You know what? I stand corrected. The survey does say it's that. It's all in the survey. Thank you very much. If it was based on who has the most amusement parks, I think we would win. But then again, we don't have universal health care so yep that's a good point <laughs> all right thank you very much ava it's good to have you back good to be here we try to do it every night i mean i am to do we try to get ava out here every night i even set up a makeshift studio inside so she doesn't have to come all the way out to the shed but 
Thanks for all the feedback. So many people have reached out and said that they just think that's a fun, lovely idea. And Ava, getting a lot of experience. We're building a portfolio for her if she decides to go into some kind of media, broadcasting, journalism. Who knows? Acting. You never know. Comedy. Oh, please. No. Okay. Well, now it's time to get to today's guests. Coming up, my conversation with NPR's education correspondent, longtime guest of mine, someone I always love talking with, Anya Kamenetz joins me for, I think, I don't know, the second, third, fourth time here on the podcast. Great conversation, really important stuff that I learned in my talk with her. But right now, I've got a senior fellow at Fair Vote, fairvote.org. He's the author of Rat Fuck, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy, as well as Unrigged, how Americans are battling back to save democracy. And nobody covers the issues of redistricting and gerrymandering better than David Daly, who was once uh, the senior editor-in-chief of Salon.com, former CEO and publisher of the Connecticut News Project. Really, really smart guy. He has appeared in The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The Guardian, New York Magazine, Atlantic, Boston Globe, and so much more. And... I'm very happy to have him joining me, giving me an update on all the really important issues surrounding the most important issue of of regarding our democracy and and how it's rigged and how it's being stolen and how we can win it back. I think that you will really like our conversation, and I hope that you'll let him know on Twitter at DaveDaily3, D-A-L-E-Y 3, at DaveDaily3. Here we go. (laughs) What is something that David Daly doesn't know anything about? <laughs> something that I know nothing well, about. Well, is there like well, a is there a, a cultural blind spot? Do you are you a TV movie guy? When I ran Salon, I had to be up on right. all of this stuff. I had to be up on everything. So I sort of gave it up almost completely when I walked out the door. So my pop culture since 2017 is um pretty limited to the streaming shows that everybody watches. And then there's a pandemic on top of that. So like who goes to the movie theater anyway? So let me start there by asking you, I ask a lot of my guests who are thoughtful folks, which is pretty much everybody where, where they're at with the pandemic. How how are you doing? How's your family? How are you, how are you seeing it? Are you gradually changing? Did you change a long time ago? Are you still hiding? Because I am 51 years old, I went out and saw the Psychedelic Furs on Friday night. So I went to a a concert and stood next to people. A few days earlier than that, because I have a nine-year-old, I took him to New York and we went to see Girl in Red. Have you heard Girl in Red? No. Tremendous indie pop. Uh, She's from Denmark or Sweden. And let me tell you, she comes out. And she launches into the first song and she's hurling herself about the stage with just just joyous abandon. And it was just, I have missed this. I needed this back in my life so badly, live music. And so I I am hopeful, right? I mean, it's it's been two years. Uh, our kid's school removed mask mandates today. I think he was a little bit on, a little bit off. We'll find out. But... I mean, I'm going to I'm going to be hopeful here. I love it. I love all of the things that you just said. World in red dot com is the website for Girl in Red, which is an indie pop music project of Norwegian singer, songwriter and record producer Marie Ringheim. Ringheim. Cool. So So great. So you also I know you had just told me before I hit record went to Selma for a march. That's a thing to do around people. More importantly, why did you go? What did you see? What did you learn? It was the 57th anniversary of Bloody Sunday um, in Selma, Alabama, the day that really we won the Voting Rights Act in many ways. Right. It was it was paid for with the blood of uh, John Lewis and all of all of the folks who walked across the bridge that Sunday and were met with Alabama state troopers and tear gas and horses and dogs. Um, And when the nation saw this that Sunday night, when all the networks interrupted with footage, Lyndon Johnson realized something had to change. And 
you know, it was a really powerful moment. I was there as the guest of Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, which was just an incredible honor to be able to stand at his side and sort of walk across the bridge with him, you know, because 57 years ago, the Voting Rights Act was won here, but what we're seeing now is it's being chipped away, you know, 60 miles north East in Shelby County, Alabama, is where the case began that really eviscerated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which has just been, you know, so damaging to our democracy and voting rights. There's a case right now that the court has indicated it wants to hear on uh, Section 2 and redistricting in the Voting Rights Act. So Alabama remains ground zero even 57 years later. So we don't go to Selma as historical reenactors. Um we go to rededicate ourselves to a fight that has never ended. Well said, really, really well said. Would you say that the the movement that Dr. King and John Lewis and and all some of the people that were probably there when you were there a couple weeks ago uh, were were there again, the vice president was there as well, right? Kamala Harris was there. Would you say that that movement that they were involved in, that they led, that they, as you said, blood and and died for, that we're just seeing a continuation of that right now with activists, uh, both on the ground and in Congress? I think there's some really great representatives and senators um, like uh, the the senator from uh, Georgia, Raphael Warnock. I think he's uh, rhetorically doing a great job, and I think he's doing everything he can to keep uh, the the lens focused on voting rights with everything else that's happening. Yes. I mean, um, I think that there's real awareness, I think of just how existential and dangerous this moment is for our democracy. You know, the Democrats in the house and Senate made voting rights, their top priority in this Congress. And in the last Congress, you had 48 members of the Senate, that were willing to suspend the filibuster rules and amend those rules uh, in order to do something to protect voting rights. You All you have to do is have your eyes open to what's happening at state legislatures around the country to understand that January 6, 2021 was a dress rehearsal for what could happen on January 6, 2025, and that Republicans are in better position now to succeed than they were on that day a year ago. Uh, And after the 2022 elections, they could have the House and key Secretary of State positions. uh, And they are moving on anybody on these local election boards who will not stand up for their big lies. So this this is a serious moment, and we can't take our eyes off of it for one second. Yeah, and you are the guy that isn't, and we thank you for it. And you're covering this. You've been writing about it at CNN.com. You've been writing about it at Salon, uh, obviously uh, on social media, and I'm sure places I missed. But uh, you wrote a, a great piece at Salon with our friend Gabby Goldstein, who's doing great work at Sister District. And it's about the independent state legislature doctrine, which don't bore me. Because this is very important and scary what this is. And I didn't know about it. It's horrifying. Um, (laughs) You know, Republicans don't stop. The conservative legal establishment never stops. They are always looking for the next angle and the next wackadoodle theory that they can come up with uh, to try to essentially close the circle on entrenched Republican minority rule. That's what this really is about. So what the independent state legislature doctrine effectively says is that state legislatures, free from any threat of veto by the governor or free of any threat of review by state Supreme Courts, have unfettered control to set election law and election procedure. And you would say, that's nuts. (laughs) <laughs> that's crazy. There's like state constitutions. There's there's checks and balances. Why would it be different? And this is 
a strict originalist reading of the elections clause of the Constitution. I won't bore you with that, but it's completely ahistorical. It's contrary to hundreds of years of precedent. It's wildly anti-democratic. It would be a seismic earthquake underneath our politics. And we know that there are three Supreme Court justices who are already in favor of this. There could be a fourth in Kavanaugh, and we don't fully know where Roberts or Barrett stands. But what that would do, that just to be clear, the consequences, if there are three branches of state government, the governor, executive, uh, the, the judicial, which is the Supreme Court of the state government, and then the legislative, what, what you're saying is this is an interpretation that lets the state legislature – which is a bunch of, you think that the, they're wacko at the national level, at the state level, I mean, there's some flat earthers. And you earthers. think they're gerrymandered at the national level. They're gerrymandered at the local level, too. Right. They're also, ger- so it's giving them the, the in, full power to decide on the outcome of the election. From election outcomes to how you allocate electoral college electors to whether or not you do a redistricting commission, to whether or not those maps can be reviewed or vetoed by anybody. So these cases started because the Supreme Courts in North Carolina and Pennsylvania uh, got involved and said, these Republican congressional maps violate our state constitution. Right. Our state constitutions protect free and fair elections. These maps are not free and fair. Uh, So we are overturning them, or in Pennsylvania, they stepped in and said, we're going to insist on a fair alternative. And Republicans challenged this to the Supreme Court, and they said, you don't have the power to do that. State courts cannot do that, because under the Elections Clause, all power is vested in in the legislature. And Three Supreme Court justices were willing to go along with something that insane. You're talking. Uh, th- are you talking about the March seventh decision? Or the decision at the uh, at the beginning of March that came down from the Supreme Court because you. Uh, it's a really important decision, and you know might have been undercovered. But uh, the this what did the Supreme Court decide in terms of North Carolina's yeah. Republican request to throw out? the non-gerrymandered congressional map that was won by Democrats in state court, because it would it would seem to be a triumph. The point you're making is that there were three conservative Supreme Court justices that ruled against it. But it is a, a, a big win. You write. This was good news in the short term. The North Carolina and Pennsylvania maps will be fair in 2022. But there's a time bomb that is ticking for the future because you've got the court upheld the rights of those courts to intervene, but it was a 6-3 court. And the the, the decision broke down with the three liberals joined by Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Barrett with Thomas Alito and Gorsuch in the three. And then if you dig into those opinions, what you see is that the three justices in, in the minority are all in on this independent state legislative doctrine. They think that the court would, would have found on the merits that these the state courts could not have gotten involved. Right. Justice Kavanaugh, in his own opinion, while he says there's not enough time for us to get involved now, I want another case next year that will tee this whole thing up with oral arguments and briefs. It's a really important question, and it's got to be settled now. Kavanaugh, in one of the 2020 election cases and one of his footnotes, suggested he was on board with some of this. Mm. So I would call Kavanaugh probably a fourth vote after full arguments. And then it becomes a question of what will Barrett and Roberts do? We don't know what Barrett will do. She has not had a, much of a history on election law questions. Roberts was a no this time. 
But if you go back to the uh, 2015 Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission case, which is the case where Republicans in Arizona challenged the constitutionality of the state independent redistricting commission under really similar lines, the constitutionality was upheld 5-4, but uh, you had Ginsburg and Kennedy in the five. Roberts wrote the case dissent, and he is scathing. And he says, legislature means legislature means legislature. Mm. Was he open to this? Uh, Possibly. Uh, There could already be five or six justices that would explode this time bomb. So in the short term, uh, which is why. Short term, good. Long term, really scary. Well, which is why it would seem that you are taking issue with a lot of the way that things are being framed by outlets like The New York Times and NPR, uh, because, for example, a headline in New York Times reads a potential rarity in American politics, a fair congressional map. They're talking about this year's congressional map. And you've been writing about gerrymandering and covering this better than anybody in, in all of media. And so what you're saying is that this is just this cycle, and even though it might be fair, it's still not quite uh, fair, and not to mention down the road, the the next cycle. It, it, I mean, and this, I think, is the problem with media and the problem with the progressive movement is they don't realize that Republicans are playing the long game. There might be some short-term setbacks with decisions, but as you said earlier, and as Steve Bannon has made no secret of, they're taking over local election boards and so on. So is that what issue are you taking with the way that it's being framed? Am I am I saying it right? No, I think you're exactly right. Um, there are uh, there are real dangers lurking in the federal courts to free and fair elections. But the idea that this redistricting cycle has been fair or or positive or anything less than a partisan bloodbath is is insane. And unless if you are part of the horse race politico media, you should understand that. Democrats might not have done as bad as some people thought that they would do this cycle because they themselves wildly gerrymandered New York, Illinois, uh, Maryland, in order to try and um, block some of the Republican gerrymanders. And, you know, I mean, I get that. I mean, nobody ought to be in favor of unilateral disarmament. But the result of that is we've got almost a 100 percent frozen map of red and blue seats. You're going to have the fewest number of competitive seats that we've seen in modern times, perhaps as few as 15 or 16 of 435 seats. What does that mean that to be just real quick? What does it mean to be not a, a, a competitive seat as a result of the way the map was drawn? I know you've defined this. You've written about it a million times, but just, no, just... No, sure. Yeah. Um, it means that the result is preordained because the the district is so red or so blue that it's impossible to imagine it tipping. You know, it's 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 a plus seven to plus uh, 35 seat or so. But that's not uh, a result that, of organization. That's not a result of democracy. That's a result of the way that yeah. the district was literally drawn to include the people who are only likely to vote for one or the other. Exactly. Okay. Because they know as they draw these lines who lives there and how they voted um, and just about everything about you. And so these map makers can draw, can go up and down streets and effectively dictate election results for the next decade. And that's what they have done. But there's also another really important question here. And as, as, as the New York Times and Politico and everybody does their horse race stories as, as Team Red or Team Blue coming out ahead and redistricting, What they're missing is that this cycle has been horrific for minority representation. Population growth in this country is being driven by Latino voters, by Black voters, by Asian voters. And in the states where Black and Latino and Asian population growth has been the largest, they actually lose political power in places like Texas and Georgia and Florida. This is a result of redistricting. Redistricting is supposed to even out population. It is supposed to 
ensure that new demographics and, and changing populations equate to political power. And that's what is being blocked. Yeah, you write this in your CNN.com piece, almost exactly how you just said it. Population growth, especially across the South, has been driven almost entirely by communities of color. Political power, however, has not followed. You know, it's such a shame that people don't realize this and understand this because it's just not as visceral. It's it's elections. It's slow moving. It's organization. It's discrimination, and marginalization, but it's different than a viral video of a, of a police officer abusing a black person, but it's in so many ways more damaging than one person, you know, terribly losing their life or being physically abused or even incarcerated. It's the disenfranchising of an entire community so that they can't make those reforms when it comes to law enforcement or anything else. How, how do you how do you feel about the way I framed that? You're exactly right. This this isn't asking people how many bubbles are in a bar of soap before you allow them to vote. It's allowing people to vote, but just ensuring that their districts and their neighborhoods have been cracked and packed in so many ways that they can't elect anybody who actually looks like them or uh, votes their way on any of the issues that matter. And it ensures that white people stay in charge. Yeah, you have so many statistics in all this piece, so much research in, in all your CNN.com, CNN.com stuff lately, as well as obviously your books. But you write Alabama is nearly 27 percent black and have seven congressional seats, which could easily correspond to two minority opportunity districts in a state with a historically uh, history of racially polarized voting. But that's not how Republican lawmakers drew the lines More evidence yeah. of this. And yeah. it, it's so much it's so much more disproportionate than the actual population voting population. That's exactly right. And I mean, I mean, two of seven is 28 percent. Right. So it would be really, really natural that this isn't advanced math. I couldn't I couldn't do it if it was advanced math. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, two by seven. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm enough of a baseball fan to uh, know that if you're, you're two for seven, you're hitting 286. And instead, Alabama has drawn its congressional districts to ensure that black voters have one of seven, which is 14.3 percent for 27 percent of the population. It is intentional. It is surgical. I went down and I drove the districts. I saw it with my own eyes. Oh, really? What was uh, that like? What was unbelievable. that? Can you can you like recognize like could you draw those lines based on you see where oh, certain people yes. are living? One hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the city of Montgomery, the city of Montgomery has been completely cleaved into 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 its black neighborhoods and its white suburbs with, you know, big Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and Barnes and Nobles. And and the black districts are 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 cracked and packed into 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 the uh, Terry Sewell seat that then stretches all the way up to the black neighborhoods of Birmingham and neatly avoids all of the white neighborhoods about 110 miles to the north. Uh, it is it is obscene and it is intentional uh, and it is every bit as discriminatory in its intent and effect as anything that was done in the South prior to the Voting Rights Act. Being so passed. important. Such a such an important point. And the fact that you're covering it and you've been there and you traveled it like a, an excellent journalist does. Um, you also write. While much of the political media has concentrated on the important partisan implications of redistricting, there's much more at stake. A multiracial nation has arrived. These gerrymanders seek to submerge it before it can blossom. Very well said. And I don't know if you can add anything to that because it's so well said. But we are becoming a multiracial nation. The question is whether we can become a multiracial democracy. And our, our track record on that is not very good. Right. Before I let you go, we are uh, having the uh, confirmation hearings have started for Judge Ketanji Brown uh, Jackson, and she's obviously the first black woman nominated. And I just want to know what you think of, of what's happening right now. These Senate confirmation hearings in general, what it means to have her on the court and how you're seeing her at least up until now, be treated by Republican senators whose job it is to vote for her confirmation. It's an inspiring moment in in a lot of ways. You know, whenever these these amazing firsts happen in front of us, um, you know, it's history. 
it's 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 late. It's you know it's awfully late uh, for us to to still be you know breaking through some of these ceilings, but um, inspiring when it happens. Uh, I am struck by what a gerontocracy we live in with yeah. 89 year old yeah. Charles Grassley yeah. and uh, some of these uh, senators asking questions. I'm struck by what just a corrupt, a contradictory asshats, uh, Ted Cruz and uh, Josh Hawley are. Am I allowed to say asshats on, on the show? I mean, I if, you I, wanna, if you want to, if you want to marginalize them, so so punitively, so uh, ass clowns, maybe I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Did you see Ted Cruz arguing at the uh, Montana airport with a gate agent? I missed that. Is a video of it. It's great. It's a video of it this morning. I just, and he's wearing a mask and you just have to wonder if the guy recognizes that he's <laughs> imagine just getting into an argument with Ted Cruz and realizing maybe early on, maybe right at the beginning, maybe in the middle. Oh my God, I'm arguing with Ted Cruz. Was he flying to Cancun? I don't know why he was in Montana. Probably a fundraiser, right? Maybe he was hunting duck or something. Well, yeah, he's a, he's a total asshat. Those guys are just, I, I wrote about, you know, I, every once in a while I take a real cheap shot. And I, I did that today with, with Josh Hawley uh, because, you know, he's that kid in high school that everybody hated because he was just always about promoting himself and he was just obnoxious. And his record as a senator, his voting record, his his rhetoric record, his January 6th fist bump shit, his vote. I mean, he's such a clown. I can't believe he's a U.S. senator. He is a value. He has no values, no principles and no morals. And neither do Ted Cruz. Like they don't stand for anything at all but power and their own ambition. I can't say it any better than that. Right, Amen. Well. Rant over. Thank you for hearing it. Amen. Uh, anything else that you want to yell and scream? Because I always want you to yell and scream about these redistricting gerrymandering issues that we need to know. You've been I'll, I'll put all the uh, links to your recent pieces uh, in the show notes. But anything else? Sweet. No, thank you. No, I, I, I'm so glad to have a place to say, yes, the partisan breakdown of all of this. It's important. And, and, and no one's going to say it's not important. And no one's going to argue here for unilateral disarmament. But there's a bigger picture here yep. beyond a red versus blue, and that is whether we have a system that actually represents all Americans. And our voting system has been used since 1776 and 1619 in ways to perpetuate white political power. And we're in a moment in which this is happening again. And we all think, well, if I was around in 1965, if I yep. was if I was there in 1879, I would have stood up and I would have said something. It's happening right now. Think, this is you, the latest chapter in a political in a fight for political power that is as old as 1619, as old as 1776, 1865, 1879, 1965. 2013 at Shelby County, and it's happening right now. We've got to stand up on the side of what's right. I, you know, I always think about that, and I, I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world. So I am standing up. I'm very organized and involved in my community uh, for, you know, electing Democrats, progressives, and on certainly specifically on the school board stuff I, I'm very involved with. But I do realize as we look back in history, you like to think I would have been on the right side of it. That's easy to say, but it is harder to do for the whites because the whites think w when these things happen, I see realistically that they think they have something to lose. When you stand up and you speak out, you become a target uh, of at least mean commentary on the local Facebook page. If not at the BOE meeting, you become marginalized yourself. You have something to lose. Maybe your kids are going to be bullied in school. And so that's why the whites don't stand up because they don't really have something to gain specifically as much maybe as, as they have to lose. That's what I am observing in, in my town and in my community. Good people not necessarily doing anything because it's scary. These racist people are scary. What do you think of that? We're heading towards entrenched white conservative minority rule at just about every level in our politics. And it's going to take all of us to stand up and say no and that's going to involve some fear and it's going to involve a, a price, but it's nothing compared to the price that's been paid by right. others over the course right. of, of three centuries of, of 
white political power. I would argue it's nothing compared to the indignities that they are either dealing with um, every day or very, very regularly or consistently. That's the thing that I, I have such a hard time understanding about white folks that they just can't have enough empathy to realize how much worse it is for people of color on a regular basis in terms of, I guess they don't have the empathy because they just don't, they just don't know. They truly don't believe it. They don't know any, any people of color that they're really close with, that they listen to, that they um, admire and respect. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's just so uh, night and day and so obvious to me that how could you not see that? Hey Amen. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's spot on. David Daly, keep up the good work. Thank you very much for talking to me. And uh, I really, I really always appreciate your time and your work. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. David Daly, Dave Daly 3. Go find him on the Twitter. Go buy his books, but let him know that you enjoyed our conversation. Always learn a lot from him. Super smart guy. Read his pieces and, uh, and keep in touch. And let me know what you think. All right, now it's time to get to my second guest of today's show. She is one of the most important journalists in the country covering education. She's the author now of, I think, five books. We talked today about her new book coming out in August, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. This was a really wonderful conversation. I was really happy about it. I thought it was smart. I think I made a couple good points and asked good questions. Anya Kamenetz always has awesome answers. You really should get all of her books. The Art of Screen Time was her last book. You can also subscribe to her newsletter, which I love. Her website is anyakamenetz.net. And, of course, always follow her on Twitter at Anya1, Anya, A-N-Y-A. Ladies and gentlemen, Anya Kamenetz, back on Stand Up. Okay. There's Anya. I see her and I'm very excited to talk to her and always happy to hear her reporting on NPR. To have her here is a great privilege. And also congratulations to you on the new book, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go. No one's been covering it better than you, Anya. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Pete. It's it's really uh, nerve wracking, but exciting writing the book the issue or just uh both together i guess uh so with the book so the book's officially out in august by the way you can pre-order it now um and please do uh the this is such a fraught conversation and as a reporter i can kind of curate people's responses but this is really me telling the story and so i'm going to put put it out there. And so people are going to have their reactions to that. And you know how that goes. Okay. I see. So what you're saying is you're uh, concerned about how your interpretation is going to be received by people. And if it's going to create a real controversy over some of the way that you frame this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, you know, and there, there are real differences of, of opinion um, I think throughout this pandemic, people have also felt entitled to their own facts. Um, but really, this is a values conversation. And I, and I hope to try to get to that, the point of that. And, and what I hope we can all agree on is this idea that the cho- you know, children are important. They are the future of the country. You know, we say these things so many times, but, you know, how do we actually act in ways that uphold that value? That's really what the book's about. So many stakeholders when it comes to this and all of them have every right to be indignant, to be anxious, to be angry, to be afraid. The parents of students, the students, the teachers who I feel the worst for, because people always forget that they are also parents. Like it's as if like my, my heart has always been for teachers. My mom is a public school teacher, but not to mention the administrators. Nobody cares about the administrators. Anya, I actually got, have gotten to know them and, and do care about them. They didn't, they have no idea what they're doing. No one has known what they were doing. We've never been here before. And so to have compassion for them, but the point I'm making is all the different st- stakeholders. It's important to, to hear from all of them. How do you do that? Um, you do a lot of listening. Yeah. Um, you're willing to be wrong and to be attacked because it's not about me. Uh, I've really grown as a reporter through all of this Mm. because 
there have been so many emotions and I've never had so many people cry in my Zooms. I don't know if you've had that. As oh, yeah. A podcast. I cry in my Zooms alone before the guest gets here usually, though, but that's different. I just get <laughs> nervous. Perfect. I get nervous. No, just just sure. the rawness of it, right? You know what I'm talking yes. about. Yes, yes. People need to talk and you're totally right. I mean, I love that you said that about parents who are teachers. In my book, there's five families and three of them have some connection to education. So um, there's a special education aide, a public school teacher in rural Oklahoma with five kids, and then another one who's a health uh, health uh, education coordinator. So they're all doing some role in the schools and then they're dealing at home with the consequences of school closure at the same time. Um, and yeah, it's just an artificial divide, really. I mean, it's really a, a competition of who's losing because everybody is losing uh, in, in, in different ways. I mean, people are losing money in terms of they can't go to work because they have to stay home to take care of their kids. And then there is that thresh threshold for a lot of, you know, fairly affluent parents that want to put their very young kids in preschool or daycare. They're not making that much more money than that would, than that would cost. So why even go to work? Um, yeah. How much, how much of the, that did you cover? And, and, and do you think is, is, really created a, a major problem for people or have they recovered? They haven't recovered. The The sector of childcare has not recovered because subsidies to the sector have been cut off. And so you have a situation where you can make $22 an hour at a Walmart warehouse, $18 an hour at Starbucks or $13 an hour to raise the next generation of infants and toddlers. <laughs> well, when That's you put it that way. That's what we've agreed to in this country, even if you have money. And here's this, I mean, the, the bizarre thing is, and I'm not like singling anyone out, but if you have money, you can get an au pair, pay them $4 an hour, or you can get, you know, someone who is like a full-time nanny, who's someone who doesn't have a passport or they don't have a green card, pay them $15 an hour. Like that's what we do. And everybody shuts up about it. Um, but we, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go beyond this. The Federal Reserve, not a bleeding heart liberal organization, issued a report in September 2021 saying this is a market failure. It's a textbook market failure. The, we don't. The, there's you know. a, uh, I'm sorry. Did you have one more point to make? Because yeah. there, there is, you just shared this tweet from, I think it's a Wall Street Journal. No, a Washington Post economics reporter, Jeff Stein and then yeah. I just shared it after I was going through your Twitter uh, timeline. And he writes, the expanded child tax credit has been dead for almost three months now due to Joe Manchin and Republican opposition in the Senate. As far as I can tell, there's no reason to believe that changes. Four million kids thrust back into poverty, child poverty rate up to 41 percent, totally disappeared from the discourse. And, and Anya, I, I bring that up only as a point to that we, we had not solved, but made the biggest dent in childhood poverty in this country in a generation. Ask anybody who works in poverty, specifically around families. And, and we really did it. And then it expired. And what would that do for so many families in conjunction with all that you cover regarding education? So, I mean, the big picture thing here to understand is that we as a nation choose to keep children in poverty. We choose to do it. And it wasn't always the case. It used to be that the poorest Americans were elderly Americans. They were pr proportionally more likely to be poor. What did we do then? We created this thing called Social Security. Social Security worked. It got old people out of poverty. But we destroyed aid to families with dependent children, starting with welfare reform in 1996. And we have not replaced it with anything that actually works. And so we've had this rising rate of child poverty, which is correlated by the fact that you know, the generation of children is a more diverse generation than any generation has come before it, more likely to have a parent who's an immigrant um, and speak different languages. And so these are kids that do not look like, quote unquote, our kids of people who are white, who are taxpayers, um, tax bases in a lot of places that have, you know, want to protect their property taxes and all of that. Mm -hmm. So we choose this. And when we choose child poverty, we choose childhood trauma because children who grow up in poverty are more likely to experience adverse childhood experiences, such as losing a parent to COVID or anything else. And so we choose the misery of children. That is a public policy in the United States. It, I don't know how to put it any like more dark than that. 
I, I mean, I could, it, that's exactly what we're doing. I think most people just have no idea. They have no idea. And they think, you know, the myths around, are around the creation and sustainment of poverty about laziness and, and all of it. And it's obviously always disproportionately people of color, even with all things COVID when the treatments member not too long ago, when public policy, health policy was to uh, give, uh, you know, those who were disproportionately affected by COVID, the yeah. treatments ahead of the line, if you will, because they were the worst off. And it became Trump and others went out and said, they're, they're putting white people behind black people for treatments. And it's boom, boom, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the truth is. And it makes it so much harder to get ahead. Let me switch gears and talk, stop ranting and ask you about the teachers, these teachers who are also parents, especially in this latest wave in January, which you covered so well at NPR because it really was the worst for so many people because so many people got sick. And in my community, people were all complaining about closing the schools. And they just kept saying, there's no one in the schools. There's no one to open it. Forget the teachers. There's no one to keep the heat on. There's no one to clean the toilets. There aren't. What if there aren't? What if there aren't? What are you going to do? So how did that play out for teachers? So I think you're right to say that, you know, we're expanding it beyond teachers and, and we're really looking at people like school staff, um, including aides, classroom aides. And these are where the real shortages are, because, again, these are lower paid people. They're also more likely to be people of color, They're all of the support staff in a school. Um, it, it's very scary because, you know, there's a sense of, um, you know, really being pushed to the limit and taking things from all sides. So I just reported on a survey from the um, American Psychological Association. They had a task force. They surveyed 15,000 educators from all over the country, all 50 states. Yeah. And, you know, the, the number one thing, obviously, you know, half of teachers are thinking about leaving the profession. That's been a pretty like steady finding. And that was before you know, that was bef sorry, before COVID, you had covered that. Yeah extensively. Yeah. I talk to teachers and teachers unions all the time. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, and it got well, yeah, worse. Yeah. So in some ways, that's not that different. The difference is the level of vitriol that they're getting from parents around COVID, but also around Black Lives Matter, around politics, around gender, and the level of entitlement that parents have where, I mean, you know, I had this teacher who has put in her resignation. She was like, I don't know how much longer I can take this verbal abuse yeah. where I have to sit and take it because I'm a teacher, because I, I'm the one I've been trained in de-escalation. I've been trained in restorative justice. I know how to handle it when somebody's going off on me, but why do I always have to be the grown up when a parent can freaking yell and scream at me and then call my manager literally. And that's the relationship that they have to me that they don't see me as a respected member of their community or the person that's responsible for their kids development they see me as some person that they can unload on. So much of the, the issue, so many of the issues that the teachers were having before COVID didn't really have to do as much with being abused by community members, parents. There were so many other things, the testing regime, uh, all kinds of anti-union destruction efforts. And, and we could talk and we did wow. back in those times, Anya, all about that. But this like you've covered this in depth in that survey. There's a ton of data. These teachers are being screamed at over COVID protocols and now over what they are actually teaching in their class. Is that right? That's exactly right. And there's a sense of surveillance that started with remote learning where parents that I hear this all the time. Parents could walk by. They could overhear what was happening. They're getting it out of context. They don't sure. know what the goals are of the learning, you know, but they, they think that they know. And then and let's not forget, there are these right wing groups, right, that are organizing teachers sorry, organizing parents, preparing them with materials. Here's how you do, you know, a FOIA request. Here's yep. how you write a scary It's happening letter. in my community. I'm right in the center of it. I, I got to tell you all about it, but go ahead. Yeah. No, so you, I mean, this is, so it's not spontaneous. There's an organization level to it. And then there's the emotion that our whole community is stressed and parents are finding this outlet. Some, this is a vocal minority, right? It only takes a couple people to like ruin your day. And most parents, most parents love their public schools and most parents respect their public school teachers. Most, like, I would say it's a vocal minority, but I would say what you said is an understatement because it's a vocal minority or a minority of vocal uh, parents, community members who can change a school board where only 700 people out of 20,000 or whatever vote. I mean, it's it's them. And that's happening right now regarding this whole CRT stuff. And 
Again, I mean, yes. I'm, in, I'm right in the middle of it and, and it's wild, but teachers being uh, abused. By the way, I would overhear my daughter's teacher and I would write them emails like I was an awesome debate about economics and different forms of government. I can't believe you guys were talking about fascism and all the students were weighing in. That was fascinating. I was mostly impressed and learning stuff, but the yeah. te- the teachers are in a different position than they've ever, ever been because of this movement, I think it's fair to say. I think that's right. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't make a comparison across all of American history. I think, I think what, you know, if I would flip it around for a second and say, School is meant to be the place where we learn how to live together in a democracy. Hmm. And that is why we require kids to come to school, no matter what their circumstances or their background. They don't even have to be citizens. Right. There's very few things in our society that are public services that serve non-citizens. And we even give schools to kids in jail. Like when you're a kid in jail, in the county jail, you are not entitled to see your parents, but you are entitled to education. That's how important it is. So. What we're happy, you know, we talked in the beginning about like how our democracy is under stress. School is a fundamental unit of democracy, and that's why it's under stress. It's really important. That's why it's being attacked. It's really important. That's it's always public education has been under attack for a long time by the quote education reform movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but now it's it's different. Um, does does is the mask debate over for good? Because even liberal Democratic politicians are not, they just don't think they can go back to that because of the controversy created. And if it is over, what has it wrought? Uh, What has it done to us? Anything permanent? That's a great question. Um, I do think that mask mandates are going to be very hard to reinstate absent a very severe new variant with a totally different death rate and profile and everything else. I think we're People are very done. And that's Where true. At, the kids are getting themselves maybe much sicker, probably God too. Forbid, we never we see don't that. care about their, their parents or grandparents. That's clear. Yeah. But, but God forbid that we see that, but yes, I mean that, that I think it's going to be really hard. What is it wrought? I think that the, <sighs> there's a sense of betrayal by a lot of people, people who supported mask mandates and wanted remote learning to last longer and people that didn't think, you know, didn't think any of it made any sense, both feel a little bit more alienated from their schools. There's been enrollment drops, especially in big city public districts and sort of a disaffection, like the, the strong support by people of their public schools has not gone away, but there have been some pulls in the other direction. And that's where you see things like in the Virginia governor's race where people say, you know, my school was always there for me until it wasn't. Or it wasn't the school that I wanted it to be for me when I needed it. And so that feeling, I think, is going to take a while to unwind. And exactly who benefits from that is people who, you know, people who basically don't like public education as an institution. They want to promote alternatives to public education. Right, rather right. Than being privates, charters. Do you think you're, how, how different would your job as NPR's education correspondent be as a journalist, even covering especially uh, young people? be if Build Back Better uh, became law, if there was all of this money to really transform education. Specifically, I always think about the universal pre-K idea and if that were funded. You covered for NPR a lot of and interviewed uh, people who ran preschools out of their homes, teachers, aides, and so on. You understand this age group and how important universal pre-K is that are development and outcomes at adulthood. How different would your job be if that money went through? Because wouldn't it really be transforming so much of our society? Am I overstating? You're going to make me cry thinking about it. And I'm never invited to think about the positive aspects of this, but what build back better really had was a set of programs that fit together that would finally put us in the running amongst our peer countries for actually having a youth focused agenda and a family focused agenda, which is also a workplace friendly agenda. All of these things fit together. It's getting mothers into the workforce. It's getting our next generation educated so they can join the workforce. It is, uh, it is preventing childhood trauma and addressing the childhood trauma that they've already been through, which has lifelong effects, improving health, um, knitting families back together that have been so driven apart by this. I mean, the, the benefits would be so big 
There's, you know, what an investment in a child is a long, any investor will tell you, you want to go for the long-term gains. You get so much more growth potential when you get in early on any investment. And a child is no different. Investments you make in the first three years are so much bigger. When you try to, you know, you try to get a kid who has been through trauma, foster care, their parents incarcerated, they've lost people. You get them when they're 18. Of course, there's a lot you can do. Every human being is full of potential. But if you can get them when they're babies and give them stability, give them hope, give them structure, give them the basic necessities, you're making a human being. This isn't theory. This is actual uh, born out in practice in Canada, Israel, the UK, almost every other country, Finland in the world, Japan, where they understand this. And so they do make this investment and have universal pre-K uh, as expensive as it is. It, it's something we can certainly afford in this country. I would argue that the investment we made in my younger one's ballet lessons probably wasn't the best investment given the fact that she did not stick with. I kid, it was like everything, the, every opportunity that you do actually give your child, if you have the kinds of resources that we've had, whether it be sports or dance or leadership yeah. programs, language, music, art, whatever it is, all of that is an investment. And you can only do that if you have the resources uh, uh, available. But every investment you make in, in your child, every opportunity and door you open. I've been talking way too much, Anya, sorry. So I'll let you go on on one more uh, important point, which is, you know, if there's anything else, you know, in the book or you think that's gone undercovered as a result of COVID and schools and parents and teachers and administrators, I'd love to hear it because there are so many different, as I mentioned, stakeholders and, you know, from the bus driver to uh, the, 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 the students, obviously, to the teachers, the aides, all of it. And Everybody has been affected. And what your book talks about a lot is how much of it's permanent, how, 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 how much of an impact did it make on all of us, especially the kids? So I never, so I guess I'll address that part first. Uh, nothing's permanent. We have a opportunity to redress harms. Hmm. So in restorative justice practice, right, you talk about what happened, who was harmed. And then you talk about how you're going to, re to recover from that harm. So it's not a, a point of putting a brand on these kids and saying they're generation C and they're always going to be below. Mm. No, no, we have to fix it. We have to give them the intensive supports and the level of conversation that I'm hearing now about mental health and social and emotional mm. for all the kids, no matter how materially privileged they were through the pandemic is huge. And we need to keep amplifying that and saying we need a public health approach to mental health. It's OK to say you're not OK. Everybody can help. Everyone can be a listener. We can build that emotional literacy and maybe get a more tender hearted and civic minded generation can dare to dream. Right. Well, I mean, we certainly have it in, 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 in certain. I think a lot of our young people are that in, in many ways. Um, and, and that's inspiring. I know your kids, I'm sure, are. I think I like to think mine are. But when we talk about mental health with kids during the pandemic, uh, yeah. What are we talking about? Were we talking about that they lost a certain social connection and couldn't see their friends? Because one might argue, hey, it was probably worse in 1918 when you didn't have FaceTime or texting. Uh, or are we talking about the fear that it created? Because I don't know, I kind of, you know, I think parents and, and educators, well, certainly parents, argue from the point of view of their children's experience, which is affected, I would imagine. Imagine mainly by where you live and what kind of kid you have, obviously, what there are already issues and then their age. You know, it affected you. I always take for granted that my kids are teenagers and they were fairly unaffected. I will say by it. They were I, I, it seems they were they weren't impacted dramatically by the pandemic. Uh, so I, I don't know. What are the what are the mental health issues and concerns? So um, I'm happy to hear that. And yes, it's not inevitability that every kid is going to ha have a clinical situation because of the pandemic. Right. Um, the rates are going up. So this is a public health thing, right? Rates are going up. Kids that had a problem before are getting worse. And that, you know, you can think about it like the old hierarchy of needs, right? So like some kids lost material things and that leads to anxiety and depression. Some kids lost a sense of safety and security because their parents lost jobs. Things were uncertain. Maybe they lost a family member or somebody and, you know, got sick and got better. Mm. They're nervous, they're anxious. So um, then there are the kids that lost sort of the pleasure and the fun and the joy of that time and the timeline. And 
you know, it's possible to kind of, if you squint, it's like, we had a real like overparenting, intensive parenting problem in affluent America. Sure did. Sure do. Overprogrammed, overscheduled, too much rushing around and trying to like micromanage. And that got disrupted. There was a circuit breaker to that. Mm. You know what? The travel soccer game is canceled. <laughs> like, uh, you know, whatever it is that you thought was so important, it's not happening now. Something else is happening. And so I think that there's a there's a chance to reflect for kids to go back and say, I got through something bad and I did it with the help of my family and the people close to me. And I'm better because, of, you know, I'm stronger now. That's a story that we can tell about the pandemic for the kids that weren't as affected. And I think it's important to do that. I think it's important to celebrate the wins because to get through a global pandemic as a child without uh, your psyche being destroyed is a huge accomplishment. And every kid should be proud of it. Every parent should be proud of their kids. Very, very well said. Uh, you, I think, are one of the most important reporters, journalists of our generation. And I'm so glad that you take time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. The new book should be pre-ordered by everybody listening. There should be thousands of pre-orders as a result. She's holding it up of this interview, The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. It's out in August. Pre-order it now. Get all of the rest of Anya's books as well. And of course, listen to her reporting on NPR, follow her on Twitter. I don't know why I'm doing all the plugs in front of the guest. I usually wait, but... It's fine. <laughs> I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking to you. Anya Kalanitz, everybody. Follow her right now on Twitter, at Anya, one Anya. So good. Get the new book, Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. So smart, so great to talk to her, anyakalanitz.net. And please let her know that you heard her here on the show. Thank you very much to Dave Daly. Thank you to Pete Coe and John Carroll every day. Thank you to DJ Monzak for the website as well as the logo. That guy's awesome if anybody wants to hire him. I don't know if he's available because he's super talented and super busy working at a big firm now. But stand up with Pete at gmail.com to get in contact with anybody else, of course, and join our community. Go to standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic right now and sign up. Sign up for a, for a subscription and, and hang out with us because we hang out every Thursday night at 8 p.m. And it's awesome. There's usually over 40 people. And I got to get some special guests. I got to invite some special guests. John Avalon was supposed to join me. Who else? I don't know. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I'm out of time. John Carroll, take us out right now. Thank you, sir. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. You got to let him know it's his turn to go. See clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Down off of your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience. But they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear and all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up, up. Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach 
poison and raise your poison every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up. 